you're here. Hey, hello. Okay. All right. Okay, let's get into it. So welcome to today's guest talk. We are here uh, with Paddy. We are still waiting for many other people to join. Actually, let me ping them now that we are starting. Okay, one minute, one minute, one minute. Okay, all right, done. So, um, Paddy is going to be uh, introducing himself much better, but a little bit about himself is that he's currently a cloud engineer and deployment at Amazon, AWS specifically, Amazon Web Services. So, we are super happy to be having him here as he's going to be taking us just through his tech journey um, and his work life working at this global company and also be giving us like, uh, you know, tips on how to actually get a job at AWS because now uh, we are in good position just to be applying there. I did to give you a little bit intro about uh, 10 Academy. 10 Academy is a tech hub and we are training young people around Africa on uh, tech related courses, especially generative AI, data engineering and, um, and machine learning. And we have com completed our first three months of the training, which was specifically the training, uh, the training phase. So the first three months, and then the rest of the three months are specifically going to be about uh, job searching. So we are currently completing our week two in the job search phase. And I can say that is going well. We're trying to put together our materials to look solid to the hiring managers. And we are also trying to start uh, putting out there our applications and majority of the people are already also into different interview processes in different companies. So yeah, that's like a quick update about uh, what 10 Academy is and where we are currently. So we are super happy to have you here today because I believe there are a lot we are going to be learning from you. I think without further ado, I can uh, pass it to you back and uh, you can take over the conversation. Oh, by the way, me who was talking, I'm Pascaline and I'm a community manager here. So. Yeah, and everyone else is an academian. Uh, we can give, can we give some reactions? Some reactions to welcome Paddy here. Okay, thank you so much, Paddy. We are super happy to have you here. You can have your video on or you can't have your video on. It's it's very okay. Just, uh, um, you know, over to you. Oh yeah, hi, super happy to see oh, you. <laughs> greetings everyone. My name is Paddy and First of all, congratulations for finishing the coursework you guys are going through. It's tough learning. Therefore, well deserved and bravo. I'm going to tell a short story about what I've done so far. And then I'd like it to be a question and answer afterwards because I might not tell you what you wanted to hear. And I think you asking questions serves the purpose of this meeting better. First, I have a background in telecommunication engineering from Jomo Kenyatta University. And telecommunication engineering basically trains you both on the electrical engineering side and information technology. The base work of that course covers electrical engineering principles, and then you move on to systems design and high capacity computing as you wind up the course. During this period of study of engineering, I endeavored to do internships during my long holiday. So for the Kenyans, for the non-Kenyans, when you study engineering, or I think any course at a public university, then you have a long holiday of three to four months after every study year. 
that gives you an opportunity to look for internships or to do anything that relates to what you're studying or doesn't relate to what you're studying. Because I know many software engineers or chemical who have backgrounds in chemical engineering. During this period, then I endeavored to have as many internships as I could because I ended up studying telecoms engineering due to influence from my cousin. As we chose courses in university for university study, then he proposed it. Therefore, I was enthusiastic to study it. But, and I, and I knew I could work at companies such as Safaricom and Airtel, and that was the scope of what I knew about the course. Therefore, during my internship periods, then I wanted to have a hands-on feeling and interact with people in the industry. My first internship was at a company called Cellulant. Cellulant is a payment services integrator across Africa. And at Cellulant, I worked in the information security and infrastructure team. The second internship, and I think onwards, was at Nokia. So for the non-initiated, Nokia is a mobile phones manufacturer. But for the initiated, and by initiated, I mean those who have been in the industry, then Nokia, Ericsson, Huawei, ZT, are all mobile equipment manufacturers and operators. <coughs> How it works in Kenya, <coughs> excuse me. How it works in Kenya is Safaricom and Airtel own the brand and the customers. But in the back and Nokia, Huawei, Ericsson, and the others whose phones you use on your hand run the equipment. So they run the hardware and the software. During my internships, I think I did three internships at Nokia slash Airtel. Then I was in the, in the mobile backbone team. So this is the team that handles the switching at the mobile switching center and so on. So I had the experience of, I had the advantage of learning 2G, 3G and 4G technologies in school and then implementing it or rather operating it for the mobile telecommunications providers. And that was helpful. Why was that helpful? It was helpful because first I got the hands-on experience so I could relate everything I was doing in class with what is in the industry. Two, I became initiated. I understood that Nokia is not only a mobile phones provider but they actually manufacture equipment and they existed. So that's knowledge of companies where I could work. And three is I met people who were in the industry and made contacts. One thing that stood out for me that I did, and I was told about it later on, was I would arrive early in the morning. And then as people walked in, I sat strategically at a desk where they would see me. So I used to say hello to everyone who came into that floor. And Nokia at Airtel had probably 30 employees. With 30 employees, then I said hello to everybody. So I'd say hello, find out about what they do, and ask for tasks. With time, we first of all became friends because we talk every day and I know about how their life was faring on and how work was faring on for them, and also the nitty gritties of what their work involved. So that was my university education together with the internships that accompanied it. Afterwards, my first job was at Airtel. So Airtel has a company called Innovis. Innovis runs the NOC, the Network Operation Center, on behalf of Airtel. And that was my first job in 2020. For, uh, and it was during my fifth year. During this time, I was in the transmission team. However, my interest lay in the core switching networks, despite there not being an opportunity at that time in that team. So as I did my transmission job, then it was an easy job, first of all. It was very routine. We'd prepare reports, we'd monitor the network, uh, Airtel's network, and with time the network became stable, which meant that I was probably active for three hours out of the eight hours I was expected to work. For the rest of the five hours, I was doing certifications and studying. So that's when I did my Juniper certifications, and Juniper was offering them for free 
post-COVID. We took advantage of Juniper and Oracle and did as many cloud certifications for both. So that gave me accreditation or credibility when it comes to networks and cloud technologies. Due to that fact, my next job was at Dimension Data, and Dimension Data is currently NTT Data, Kenya or Africa. And I got that job because of the certifications that I had done in Juniper. They were looking for a mid-level engineer with CCNP qualifications, but I talked to the engineering manager and told him I didn't have my CCNP, but I had my Juniper certifications. And given the opportunity, then I would quickly scale up and meet the requirements of what they required. And that landed me the job at Dimension Data, where I worked for three years. First of all, working in the networks team. And in the networks team, then we deployed service provider and enterprise networks for Dimension Data's clients. And this ranges from the government to large corporate organizations. So I think I've worked at all banks. I've had a few runnings where we've been sent away from the Central Bank of Kenya for messing up the network on a weekend. And all those adventures that come with deploying things during the weekend, we did them and we learned from them. At Dimension Data last year in January, an opportunity came for the cloud team as a cloud architect. And I quickly jumped onto it because I felt that I had conquered most of the challenges that lay in the networks realm. That is, I'd gotten involved in large, massive projects covering airtel deployments across the continent, bank relocations for majority of the banks. So new data centers have been built in Nairobi and with time banks relocate to them. And it's a huge two week process where you barely sleep. I'd gotten involved in those and I felt that I'd made an impact. Therefore, I moved to the cloud architecture team. An advantage of this is, first of all, the cloud space in Kenya had been a bit slow in terms of organizations willingly taking up cloud services. And majorly because of the Office of the Data Protection um the office that handles data protection and privacy they had put a caveat of the ease with which banks could go to the internet and run cloud services and that is because of privacy so personal and identifiable information however that was lifted last year or late the other year if my data is correct and it gave an opportunity for banks and enterprise organizations to start consuming cloud products. An advantage of being at Dimension Data with this wave of change was that our enterprise customers, was that we already had enterprise customers. Therefore, all the banks we had handled were now looking to move to the cloud, which means that there's a lot of work all of a sudden. It's like a dam that has burst the banks and you need to contain the damage. And the damage is the opportunity to do massive projects in terms of cloud migrations. So when I got that cloud architecture role, then we dived deep and were thrown into this melee of design, implementation, and support. Therefore, you find yourself making presentations to these stakeholders and decision makers, convincing them on how you want the infrastructure to run. They're already convinced that they want to go to the cloud because they can see what other banks in Africa and Europe are doing with cloud services and billing millions. And banks don't have, banks don't really, banks have huge budgets. So they're not like startups where the spend is a concern. Due to this, then we had the opportunity to do designs and work with solution architects across the world. <clears throat> Why we had to work with them was we were deploying Azure and AWS services. And because these were large opportunities, then those two cloud providers, cloud service providers, then provide solution architects to help integrators and partners to guide banks and these organizations consume cloud products and cloud services. 
that opportunity comes with the advantage of you're not only gaining experience to deploy cloud services, but you're also interacting with the companies where you'd like to work. And that formed the base for my Amazon journey. So during this whole time, we were doing deployments and due to requirements of automation, everything was being done as code and Kubernetes was a core technology in use. Therefore, when AWS set up in Kenya, made early last year, it wasn't largely advertised. Recruiters were reaching out to individuals. But as the year came to a close, I think sometime around September, October, then massively they rolled out so many roles, which the guys had worked with at Amazon happily shared and I applied and through their guidance, because I think interviewing is a tough process if you don't know what's happening or what's required, right? If you interview as a stranger, you have to work, all of you have to work hard, but the, the person who knows someone who works at your target company has the advantage of seeing what the interviewers want to hear away from the knowledge base. So through that guidance and with that luck and guidance, then I secured a slot at AWS in the DevOps team. So specifically, I deal with containers. And it has been a heck of a learning experience this year. Every day is day one because at support engineering, then you meet clients who are deploying solutions uniquely. So you're gonna work for Bank of America, you're going to work for Goldman Sachs, you'll find Kenya Airways in there, you'll find NCBA, you'll find Stanbic, and all of them have these amazing ways, BMW, they have all these amazing ways of deploying services in the cloud. And what happens is you need to quickly learn what they're deploying and solve the problem of what is broken. Therefore, it puts you at the front line of learning it never stops and that's why first of all i said congratulations your learning journey has gotten to where you are and now it's even going to become more the technologies are getting rolled out every day kubernetes 1.32 i think is with us and guys are still running at 1.22 so there's a whole spectrum of what you need to keep abreast with every day and that's the excitement that the job comes with so not only the opportunity to learn but also the wide bath of people you have access to. You can talk to the most brilliant engineers. You find amazing customers who are very friendly and tell you their line of thought. And you're marveled because one thing you need to acknowledge is the more you know, the more you don't know. So I think I know a lot, but once I got, I thought I knew a lot, but once I got immersed into this world, then you realize you know nothing. So every day is a day of humility and learning. And I think as the day winds down or as you wind down the week and you look back at what you learned during that period of time, then you realize your mind is consuming tons and tons of information. That gives a short summary of what I've done and how I did it. And I think going forward, a question and answer session would surface. I can't hear you. How about now? Yeah, awesome. You can hear me? Okay, all right. So I was saying thank you for sharing your journey and what has helped you throughout your journey. Uh, you know, there were so many poems to grasp. And uh, that's why I want to also open this floor just to the rest of the 10 academians, anyone who has any question, um, anyone who's curious about anything, Anyone can raise your hand or even open your mic and go. Or even if you need any clarification or just have a discussion point. I think as, as we prepare the questions, 
um, a few the, questions. The job search journey question that I haven't, well, I think I covered it partly. Yeah, the partly. Way, yeah, the easiest way to get a job or the luckiest way, let me call it, let me not call it the easiest way to get a job. The luckiest way to get a job is look for the people who work in the companies that you want to work for. Because the job might not necessarily be advertised when you're looking for it, but within our teams, we are aware of the human resource capabilities and our bosses speak freely with us. Therefore, our bosses will mention when they want someone, even before the HR team puts it out there. And should I know you, you're probably going to interview for that role even before it's out there, right? Through a referral. Of course, there's going to be the process where you put in your CV and all. But once I've put in a good word for you, I'm willing to put my neck on the line for you, then it gives you a head start in that process. First of all, you're aware of the role before others know about it. Two, I've already vouched for you, so it's upon you to defend what I've said, and it gives you miles and bounds in that interviewing process. So the aspect of knowing people, and, and you, you might not know anyone right now, but just head to LinkedIn, look for the companies that you want to work for and then go to the people search and specify the countries. So you can filter it by country, Kenya. Look for the people in Kenya or Africa who work for those companies. Cold email them and tell them what you'd like to achieve through that relationship. So that is, I'd like to know what your company does. This is what I can do. This is what I can offer. Do you think it's enough to work for that company or what more could I add on to this? And should a role come up, could you kindly consider me for it, right? After two, one or two months of interaction, I'll always have you in mind. And not only in my company, but should a friend of mine or a colleague of mine mention something else elsewhere, then I'll be happy to front your name. So work, work hard into building those relationships. They make a huge difference, super huge difference. I see your question here. Do we use inbuilt data pipelines or build from scratch for the different companies? It depends. The use cases are the use cases are zero to one million. So it depends on a use case. Other companies use third party integrations, others use the inbuilt AWS services. So there's no formula to it, it's it's based on use case, it's based on the ease. So open source gives you the flexibility, but sometimes hinders you from integrability with the platform you're running on. Running on the cloud service providers platform gives you the ease of integrating everything together, right? Because there's the DevOps, there's the data pipelines, there's the databases, there's the storage, the network, and so forth. And if you're running everything on AWS, then it brings all this together and they easily integrate. And I see the cloud service providers are working on integrating open source tools and pipelines within the environment. So say Amazon Prometheus, Amazon managed Prometheus, Amazon managed Grafana, there's the Elastic Kubernetes service. So you have this Kubernetes open source service, but then everyone is working to put it as part of the environment so that it makes it easy to use an open source like environment to achieve what you are trying to do. Aside from Kubernetes, which other tech stack do I use on a day-to-day -day basis? I'm primarily a containers engineer and being a containers engineer. So yeah, being a containers engineer then um, primarily on the Kubernetes side. So what Kubernetes does for you is looking looking back at the evolution of how we deploy services. So we started with physical machines, right? I would write a program, 
put it into a computer, a dedicated computer, and run it from there. That means that if I want to update that program or computer, I mean, the program in that computer, then I have to take down the whole thing. Then we moved on to virtual machines, which means that Microsoft and Dell and everyone else came up with a server that you can virtualize. And virtualization means you have instances of the operating system where you run different programs in, and you can simply spin up or spin that or shut down a virtual machine. However, you realize you need to have a storage engineer, you need to have a networks engineer, a security engineer to secure this server. We then improved on that and came up with now what we have today, containerization. So containerization is an instance of the application that you're running and it doesn't care about the underlying operating system. The beauty of it is now updating a software, updating software or a program is simply taking down that version and bringing up a new one. Why I explain that is the Kubernetes engineer needs to be aware of now the network, the security, the containerization technology, the database because your applications store data in a DB, and I already mentioned the security platform. So you find yourself that you have from, if you know the TCP IP, the OSI model, then you, all the way from layer four, that is the network, until layer seven, application layer. So you have your TCP IP, you have your session management, you have your application, you have your presentation and session layers. What it does is, as Kubernetes, it sounds like containerization, but on the back end, there's networks, the storage, the security, and so on and so forth. So it's a wide and a huge um, platform to manage. Therefore, at the moment, it's primarily, so my step, my tech stack is DevOps. So the, the environment is DevOps, the stack is Kubernetes, but within it, there's a whole myriad of services that you're managing because you find people running Virtual, uh, virtualized networks. So this is overlay networks. You need to understand networking properly. So the same thing the IP engineer is doing at Airtel or Safaricom. I need to be aware of those concepts because we have companies that run a thousand nodes. So a thousand nodes is not, a thousand nodes is a complex environment because you need to network it, you need to secure it, you need to ensure the DBs are working, you need to ensure customers are hitting the proper APIs and endpoints. So it's a whole micro world to manage. Other question is, when reaching out to someone who works at a company you're interested in, how can you build a connection and demonstrate your qualifications so that they can recommend one? Okay, so there's a, there's a YouTube video about communication. I can't remember it, but I'll find it hopefully before this ends. And it talks about what you do. How do you introduce yourself when you meet someone new? So first of all is tell me who you are, right? So that's the hello, um, I'm Johannes. Tell me who Johannes is and who you, and you need to do this within five minutes if it's a conversation. So who your harness is, is I've been trained as a data scientist, as a, run, as, a, as a generative AI engineer or a machine learning engineer. What the next question becomes, what can your harness do? Yes, you have been trained as that, but what can you do? And what can you do is the physical, the, the, the tangible skills that you have, because your knowledge and your skills are two different things. So what your harness can do is I can draw insights from a pool of data. I can train AI to automate work processes. I can analyze huge data sets and this and this. And it's not only in speech of what you can do, but I can do this. For example, this is the project I worked on. And in this project, I did this and this and this. That tells me you know what you can do or you're capable of doing what you know. And finally, how is it useful to me? Yes, you can analyze data. So how you tell me what's useful to me is you've already researched 
on what I do or where I do it. And you can tell me I have observed your company in this and this, and what I can do for you is I could automate this, I could do this, and I could do this and do this. So that's the skills that I have. Once you tell me that, then I'm already thinking of where could you be useful where in, in, in the enterprise I work at. Or I already have you as a resource of should something pop up, then I know where to put you. Or I can find a gap in what you can do and tell you, I don't have an opportunity right now, but based on what you can do, look at this and this and this, it will go and augment what you can do and make you stand out. So that conversation is a short one, but very concise and precise. It tells me who you are, what you can do, and how I can apply it usefully to me. I hope that answers the question, Johannes. Super. For someone who doesn't have extensive experience in cloud, aside from networking, what skills should they get themselves familiar with? That's a good question. So my background lay in cloud, and now, I mean, my background lay in networking. But now, even for Airtel, then we have virtualized 4G, we have virtualized 5G, so everything is running on OpenShift and OpenStack, and those are technologies you need to learn. So the first, te the first thing you need to know is Linux. Linux is core, man. You recently saw the crowd strike fiasco that went and how it affected Windows, and nothing against Windows, but the cloud runs on Linux, and it's key. So Linux is a fundamental skill. You already have networking, which is kudos for you because it disturbs developers, gives them sleepless nights. The third thing now you need to learn is automation, right? I think in your curriculum, then you went through a programming language. Python is the core one we use because we don't do much of programming. We essentially use it to build scripting to script and automate our processes. So your Linux, your networking, and now bespoke cloud technologies, and these are many. So there's, there's a lot of content out here, and I can share links post this talk on one site that gives you a template of how you can go about learning to be a cloud engineer or a cloud architect. And from that, then you can build based on the underlying knowledge you will have gotten from it. Therefore, I will take note of that, and I'm happy to share those links post this conversation. Do you think there are any positions in AI, ML, engineering roles in AWS? I haven't seen them advertised so far. <laughs> do I think or do I know? Anyway. Uh, yeah. ML, yes. So this hiring was from last year, November, to I think this year in May. At the moment, there are no roles open for the engineering team in Kenya. I think most of the roles, and if there are South Africans in this platform, then the roles AWS is currently hiring for, like in my containers team, is in South Africa. So there's a whole interviewing process going down, going down there. However, as the year comes to an end, then it falls back into Kenya. And Kenya has been a high performing site since it was opened, which means that opportunities are going to keep on coming our way. Therefore, I am also happy to keep, to let guys know, and these roles when they're open, they're gonna be all over LinkedIn, but I'm happy to keep personal uh, conversations going for anyone who'd like to reach out later on and let them know when these roles open up. What would be the job description of an entry-level role, say, I am an engineer? That's a hard one to answer, because, primarily because I'm not an AI ML engineer. However, again, I'm happy to put you in touch with the AI ML engineers, the guys who work in analytics, and they will answer that question better than I would. Therefore, I could refer you to their LinkedIn and you can strike up conversations with them and they would be better placed to answer 
this particular question in Greece. I think I've answered everything in the chat. Work-life balance, I see there's a question like that in the email. It's easy. So, okay, it's it's not easy. It's, what do you call it? I lack a word for it, but scratch easy. I think it's, it's how you manage. Eight hours is a lot of time. If there's any of you here who has worked freelance, say on Upwork, where you need or, or or who's been a lawyer where you build the hours for what you actually did you will realize eight hours is taxing time every day to deliver therefore if you manage your work day if your day is an eight to five or a nine to six it's extremely possible to finish all your tasks in that allocated time frame sincerely Try a freelance job at Upwork where the client needs evidence for what you did at every minute and try work for eight hours, you will burn out. What happens, I think, where work-life balance becomes a question is the time management we have during work hours. I think I, I observe myself and others around me and a lot of time is spent in doing non-productive work. Not that it's not important, but the result is you have to dig deep into your after work hours to manage the tasks you are supposed to do during the work hours. <laughs> Therefore, it's key to ensure that you can focus. Just train, train your mind to focus. Personally, I log in at 9 and I shut it down at 6 so, or at 5. And at night, there's no electronics that I put on. Therefore, I'll wake up early and do my personal work or study. At nine, I log in into the work system. At six, I put off that laptop. And it's until the following day. Therefore, if you can if you can strike a balance and practice how to manage your eight hours of work, it's 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 too much time. So it it comes in handy to live your life after work. Could I refer you to someone who you can host next time for AI? Yeah, I'm happy to. I'll just have a conversation with them on Monday. I'm out of office today. And I think they, every, every, everyone is happy to share their journeys and provide opportunities for people they deem competent. So I'll be happy to do it. How was my experience with the interviews, if I remember any? Is there anything I could have done better during preparation and on the interview? I definitely remember the whole process. It was a gruesome experience. I had five interviews. The first one was a phone screen. And then subsequently, I had four interviews in a duration of three days. So Monday was two interviews and Wednesday, two interviews. I was lucky because not many interviews are being done at that time. Usually, after the phone interview, you do all the other four interviews on the same day. So you have a full day of interviewing, and you're fatigued immensely when that ends. The experience was superb. Compared to the interviewing, so I've, I've, I've done many interviews. I've interviewed for Cisco, I've interviewed for GitLab, I've interviewed for a couple of UK and South African companies. And what stands out for me in the interview experience for the global companies compared to what I went through for Kenyan companies is the global companies, once they get the opportunity to interview you, they're looking to hire you. They're looking for reasons to hire you. I've observed that a couple of Kenyan interviewers or local interviewers make the candidate not, do not make the com candidate comfortable enough or are not friendly enough during the interview. And it feels like a teacher student session as we did back in high school. So it gives you, even if you knew something, then your confidence ebbs away as the questions are asked because you feel like the questions are asked to eliminate you. What happens at Cisco, AWS, GitLab, and the others is the questions are asked to prove that you know it so that we can have you as part of our resources. Because 
Interviewing takes time and there's a lot to do at work. Therefore, if I'm taking an hour away from my work day to interview, it needs to be a productive hour and it's only a productive hour if we successfully hire you. So AWS and these global companies make it very friendly. They give you a very friendly environment to interview. You have the opportunity to ask questions during your interview and that is not just ask not the usual time for you to ask questions during the interview actively as i ask you what is kubernetes then it's it's an interactive conversation and we make you feel really comfortable and easy what happens when you're comfortable and easy during the interviewing process is when you're not tensed, then you can dedicate that brain power or energy in remembering or even thinking of new answers that you didn't have in mind as you're preparing. Therefore, the interviewing experience was really good. Anything I could have done better during that preparation? I don't think so. I had, I had a month. I, I spaced out my interviews immensely. And my boss was on leave. So I had time and I studied like mad during that time. So what to do is prepare adequately. Likely the questions are gonna be asked, 30 or 40% of them exist on the internet because people freely share their experiences. So go through them, go through the core concepts and the core concepts matter a lot. Don't mention what you don't know. If, if I ask you what is containerization and you say it's the use of so what is Kubernetes? It's a containerization technology, container orchestration technology, blah, blah, blah. And then you tell me so that you can run something like Jenkins. As soon as you mention Jenkins, I am on to Jenkins and we will live inside Jenkins until I prove you know Jenkins. So be really careful about mentioning buzzwords because anything you say will be used against you in the court of interview. So what you need to do is be confident in what you're saying. Just talk about what you know, express it confidently, because as soon as you mention something, you will mention it to impress me as the interviewer, but I will get into it, right? If you mention Linux, then as soon as you mention Linux, I'm going to ask you about the boot process and it's a complicated thing. And then I'm going to ask you about virtualization inside the Linux kernel and dig deep and finally you're gonna die. So be really careful about using buzzwords to impress the interviewer because it doesn't impress the interviewer. The interviewer just wants to know that you understand what you're talking about. So don't talk about what you don't understand. On the day of the interview, log in early as usual, be confident, be friendly, be in everything they say on YouTube answer confidently, smile, demonstrate your usefulness because that's why we are here to hire you. And I think you'll have a super interviewing experience, not only for Amazon, but also for other companies that will come your way. Finished all the questions on the chat, if there's any other one. Feel free to mute, ask, ask anything. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that come my way. Yeah, Hillary, please, please, Hillary. please. Okay, hi, buddy. Um, so I have some questions, but uh, taking, taping the text one. Um, one is, could you, could you advise someone to focus on one role or jump along, you know, different uh, roles? If let's say the one had uh, different uh, experience with different tech stacks, so like uh, DevOps and uh, front development, web dev, and so on. Because uh, normally there's a challenge when preparing for the resumes and cover letters. Okay, that's that's a good question. So do you focus on one thing or do you 
sort of hope around like a stepping stone and all of them. I think it's important. So let's stick DevOps. DevOps is DevOps, right? So we have a defined career line called DevOps, and inside DevOps is a whole universe, all the way from source code management to application deployment and the change management process. So that's a huge world. Should anyone, should someone try to do DevOps and then software development and then what? Then you find yourself hugely lacking in a place. You will know the buzzwords, but you will not know how to do them. Because how to do them, for example, if you want to implement a CI CD pipeline on any of the cloud provider platforms, it's going to take you half a day or a full day to do that project. Mm -hmm. What that does is if you keep taking tidbits of each, then you're not going to be efficient at one. So my mantra is do whatever you're doing at the moment or pick something and have a proper grasp of it, right? Because the question becomes, why do you want to go to the next one if you haven't mastered what you currently have? It, 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 first, it, it points or shines negatively on you in that you're not able to put your head down and master a skill. And once you have mastery, then incorporate or welcome the next skill i think it's 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 important to to do that it's important to identify something be good at it prove competence at it and once you've proven competence or near competence then you can start having a little bit of the next thing and put into it sort of like putting your house in order be, before going to change your country right so that's 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 how I look at the sweet spot for it. However, be in const be in touch, right? Be, keep your ears open and use society as feedback for what you're doing. In that, you might be studying something that is outdated. So, if you're like the soldier from Japan who stayed in the forest, thinking that the war at Nam was not over, then you're gonna come back thirty years later to a world that has moved away from you. Therefore, it is key to put your head down, but keep your ears open so that you are aware if what you're doing is necessary or not. I think that's that forms for a nice balance on it. Oh, it was my first salary. My first salary was at Innovist, was 25K. 25K is 25,000 shillings. Yep. And and there's 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 worse salaries, but I have a friend who works at Mastercard whose first salary was twenty thousand shillings, and it's almost times start three times what times three hundred or four hundred right now. So your first salary is 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 your welcome, right? Might not be the best amount of money, but it gives you. It, it keeps you alive to to it keeps you alive enough to work and get to where you want to go. What's the average salary at AWS for an entry level? So the entry level is the cloud engineer one. And and it's a range. I'll, I'll put it as a range for or it, I'm I'm hesitant to share, right? Because because I'm hesitant to share, but you and the MCA at home can sit at the same table and you can tell him this is a visory. Or I think I think I can if if I put it like that. Yeah. So for the non-Kenyans, the MCA is the member of county assembly, is a political representative, and you can ask your Kenyan friends how much they earn you and the MCA at your home can sit down and if you're wise enough they will listen to you
Yes, Hillary. Yeah. Uh, other than the other than the job, uh, other than um, other than the experience you had in internships and the connection, what's something else that gave you an age? Like, is it uh, some skills you had or certifications or anything? I think that question answers itself. So you said other than the skills and the internships, what has stood out? And then you mentioned certifications. So that's 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 a that's, pardon. No, I meant also. I was about to reduce that one as well. So maybe you could include like almost anything else here. Well, what 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 proves one as a competent employee or as a competent hire? It's the skills. It's what it's what you can do and the initiatives you've taken. Yeah especially for these global companies and they really look at the initiative so the initiative is something like the responsibility you're willing to shoulder at work so not only is that your job description or maybe it's your job description but as the individual then how far do you go to make sure you deliver that right and that looks something like if you have a project you've taken ownership of that project you're driving that project actively so even when you have a project manager then you know that project is your baby and not only are you driving it but you're also making sure that it meets the success criteria that was set at the onset of that project what that does is show that you're someone who takes responsibility and it also means that if you take that much responsibility at your job it naturally cascades to your life so being able to voluntarily take up responsibility at work is a key thing because it shows me if i was a manager that i don't have to sit and and, and boss you around you're going to identify opportunities and there's a phrase that goes opportunity lacks where responsibility is abdicated therefore is look around and, and and find places that you can make a difference in and that's in your immediate environment you can't change your country if you can't change yourself so as you interview coming back to your question hillary and you talk about the instances where you took initiative at work then it stands out immediately Im immensely it's the same thing as you when you're applying to Ivy League universities and everywhere else. They always take the people who stand out because of the initiatives they took. So you identified a problem in your immediate environment and you decided that you're the one who is going to, at least if not solve it, then try your best to solve it. So, and that means, you see, furthermore, you can't take an initiative for something you don't understand. So there's no way I'm going to solve a database problem if I don't understand databases. So your skill is key. Your certifications validate your skill or the other way around. So all those things are like a pie chart. They each contribute to whoever Hillary is when they're interviewing for a role. In a technical interview, will the focus be more on conceptual questions? I feel that many of us mainly have practical knowledge and understand how to use tools, but we might not know the mathematical background of it. I have never used the mathematical background of anything at during an interview. Right? I know I know I know a lot of math from my engineering background. And I know a lot of probability and statistics and all the skills that are imparted in us but they're not useful to the employer if i can't solve a problem with it right i know ordinary and partial i can differentiate equations to the 10th derivative but it's useless at work if if i can't apply it so no one is let me not say no one you might find someone who might ask you to do a derivative but in extremely rare cases however most inter 95 to 99 percent of interviewers will want to know what you can do that is useful for the organization 
and not what you know that is useful for your knowledge. So what you can do goes back to what you know and how you know how to apply it. Because if you don't understand Kubernetes and or if you don't understand why cloud technologies exist, right? Why do we have public cloud? And why do we encourage people to use public cloud? Why do we have some people run hybrid setups? So that is you in the public cloud and you have a connection to an on-premises data center. If you don't understand the core concept of that, then you won't phantom why you'd need to form or why you'd need to go to the cloud or even why you need to have a hybrid connection, right? Because you don't know what works behind it or why this technology was invented. It doesn't mean you know the differential equations because that's, that's now whoever writes the software for the cloud technologies, but knowing the core concept of the tools. So coming to your question, say, you feel that many of you have practical knowledge and understand how to use the tools. So one of the tools, say for the cloud is Terraform, right? You understand how to automate infrastructure deployment on cloud using Terraform. So Terraform is the tool you automate the cloud with, but you automate the cloud. So what is the cloud for you? And why are you, why, why, why are you even using Terraform to automate it? Like what, what's the alternative? or what's the consequence of not having Terraform? And hence, why was Terraform developed? See, that's a question I would easily ask you so that I prove that you're not just using this tool because if you only know Terraform as Terraform, it means that every problem is going to be a Terraform. Terraform is going to be the solution for every problem. If you only know how to use a hammer, then everything to you looks like a nail. So you need to understand why you're using the hammer so that should I give you a power saw or any other equipment, then you easily understand why you need it because you understand the problem and the solution that's required. I hope that answers your question, Johannes. Super. Feel free to unmute and yeah. think the are at the top of the hour. So Happy to answer the last questions as we wrap up. Yeah, I have one, one last question for me. Um, mm -hmm. About understanding, uh, do you think it, uh, do, when, when let's say AWS is hiring, do you think they focus more on if you understand all the concepts and everything more than the programming experience? Like you haven't done much code matching. You, can, you know, you can do it again some find help some okay so that depends on the role right and the level they're looking for you're not going to interview for a senior role if you have junior skills therefore as i mentioned the interview is there by the time you get to the interviewing phase then we're looking we are actually there for you to convince us to hire you your resume has proved you hireable so it's you to, to, to sell your resume and tell us why it convinces why we should hire you. That being said, it depends on the role you're interviewing for. If it's a junior role, then we know what a junior is supposed to do or what a junior is capable of. Therefore, we are not going to ask you to do a feature, to write a feature during that interview. I've seen engineers write features during interviews, but those are senior engineers, those are principal engineers who whom you can wake up at 3 a.m. and they'll write. You've, see, you've all seen that, I hope you've seen it. There's a Turkish shooter who, who's been participating at the Olympics without specialized equipment. So there's no way you're going to ask that of you for a junior role. The junior is gonna have to cover his eyes and put on earmuffs and everything to, to shoot at work. So. That's that's how it works. In my opinion, what level of proficiency in data structures and algorithms is typically required for technical interviews? Again, depends on that role. But it forms the background for 
you as a software engineer to do your work efficiently. Therefore, you need to know it, understand it, and be able to express yourself in terms of the code you write for that concept, right? Because I'm not hiring a Mason to write software. So it's key that you understand what's required of you. So it looks something like you need to have a mathematical background to qualify for an engineering course. It's 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 the law and over time there's a reason why it is a requirement for you to qualify for that. It's the same way I can't have someone of someone with an IQ of 50 taken to med school. Um, um it's not fair to them because they're not going to perform at med school. So it's key for you to identify what's needed for your role and be good at it. Yeah, at least there's no excuse for for that usually. So be good at what you're required to be good at. In my five interviews, did I have coding challenges? If yes, which one? Uh, good question. In my five interviews, so I was I'm interview I was interviewing for the containers and deployment role. Primarily, I did not have a coding interview or a coding challenge, but I had Linux challenges. So what my Linux challenges looked something like prepare a Docker file to containerize an application to do this and this. I have a Linux file with permissions on the directory. Change it so that this user can do this and this and this. I have an application that's throwing database writing errors. What could be the problem? Debug it and make sure my application can write to the database. I have users who are getting a 400 response from an application.balancer. Identify where the problem is and debug it and make it functional. I have pods that cannot communicate within a Kubernetes environment and probably the service account that they're using, it doesn't have the right permissions or authentication. So because mine was a containerization role, so Kubernetes, Linux, networking was the area of focus for my interviews. So my challenges were geared towards solving problems that are networks, Kubernetes, databases, storage related. However, my colleagues who sit on the coding teams solved coding challenges, definitely, given that is the requirement for their job. And I can't answer for what they did, but should they receive an invite and accept them, I think they'll be happy to share what they went through. What other questions was I asked in the, in the interview? A lot of the questions I was asked in the interview for my containerization role were, as I've mentioned, application-based questions. Because as an infrastructure engineer, then you're putting out fires or building, you're putting out fires burning houses, or you're building new houses. And the houses I'm talking about is the infrastructure on which the applications run on. Therefore, it's going to be, I have, I have a Kubernetes environment on-prem that needs to write to a database on the cloud. How do I form that connection? Can you do it? Can you automate it? Can you write? Can you do the design? And, and, and so on and so forth. I think this, this, if you go to this site with a green background, that has a lot of questions where people give reviews for companies. It also has quite interview questions. I can't remember its name at the moment, but I'll find it. Yeah. Glassdoor. Glassdoor, yeah. 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 It has good questions on, on, on what people go through. In those coding challenges or the time limits. So the interview is an hour, right? So within that hour, then each interview is an hour and four interviews. Others are one and a half hours. So what happens, I think, for the software engineers is you're given a scenario, you write the application, there's an interview for optimizing your application, there's an interview for how you do it differently, and then there's an interview finally with the hiring manager. So, and it varies from company to company as well.
Thank you so much, Paddy, and uh, also everyone who just interacted by asking questions or uh, different curiosity. I mean, this was very interactive. Thank you so much, everyone. I would like to pass this to Maggie, if there are any notes you want to add before we close. Hi, um, I don't really have much. Thank you so much, Paddy. I think the trainees have learned a lot from your experience and what you've shared. Um, just, just maybe to ask the trainees, did you, did you enjoy the session? Did you learn a lot? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Did you understand what he was saying or was a lot of things very foreign? Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, buddy. Um, I hope if if you want to connect with Paddy, I think you can connect with him on LinkedIn. Uh, I've shared his name on the chat. And um, yeah, we also we're also looking forward to hosting someone from AWS who works in the AI ML space. Um, so we will we'll also plan that and have that soon. Otherwise, thank you so much for everything you've shared. Your journey is inspiring and I hope it has also inspired the others. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, all the best. And if we also have some trainees who fit some criteria for AWS roles in future, we hope you put in a good word for them. Thanks in advance. Thank you. Absolutely. I was about to say the same, Maggie. Like, uh, uh, one of the things you told us was to tap in the people we know, so that now we know you, now we're friends. <laughs> so, to everyone who we feel like uh, they, they, they fit into an opening uh, that is at AWS, feel free to reach out, Paddy, have a chat, and see if there is anything you can do moving forward. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, nothing else. Thank you so much, buddy, for sharing us uh, your experience and a lot of wisdom in here. We took all these notes and um, we're going to be using them to our advantage, of course. And uh, we look forward to that we will be updating you uh, like individually via LinkedIn or anywhere else, to keep telling you how um, your words and advices uh, where it took us specifically. So we can wait, we can wait uh, for that. Thank you so much. Uh, have a great day moving forward. And the 10 Academians, you are the super gems and uh, you are here because you, you really want to make a difference in these upcoming few other months. And, you know, I see the best coming. So let's keep doing this. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Pleasure. Have a good day. Bye for now.